Hi folks, I'm Dave. <laughs> I'm Dale. Hey, this is my bug, Bob, and I'm Dale McKenzie. I'm Tucker. And this is I'm right. Daryl. This is my other brother, Daryl. My name is Chris from DSX Machina. And I'm Dave from Rampant Wolf Games. And we are talking about the top five games of 2019. That we that, played. That we played, because obviously we can't have, because obviously, Al Tom was talking about a game, a party game, this last week, which he said... It's officially being released in 2020. Otherwise, it'd be his game of the year. Like just last week, he was. Is, is it the one with the thermometer on his head? That one? No, no, it's the one with with, with, with a gauge. It's a gauge. They move back. It's a gauge. I don't know how the, but there's a gauge. He said he said that was his best party game he's ever uh-huh. played. Did you see his one with the, the the don't lose your cool thermometer on the head thing? No, but oh my god, you gotta watch it. He um, actually loses his cool during the review oh, and like throws it across the room. I, think. I, I, I have to check because the last three or four reviews I haven't seen it. So we are talking about the top five games that were published in 2019. And that is either a game that got its mass, mass release in 2019. Yep. Or that or, we received. Or received in 2019. Um, but for me, I did limit it to games that according to Board Game Geek actually have a 2019 descriptor on them. I didn't. Oh, God. I got, st- I got Stone Age in 2019. Anyway, so this is my top five games. Uh, I got to tell you right off the bat, all of mine except for one are Kickstarters. Uh, because Wingspan did not hit the list. Oh, mine are Kickstarter. Oh, okay. So, let's get the list. <clears throat> We're just going to do paper every single Never time <laughs> just to get it out of the way. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> Rapping rock. Okay. So, at that point, I'm going to hit it with number five. <laughs> this is just, I'm just really weird. Uh, my number five is Lord of the Rings: Journey to Middle Earth. <laughs> it's a love hate. It's on my disappointed list because I was annoyed at its difficulty. But that being said, the fact that they just lowered the difficulty, and it's got a great story to it and a campaign mode. I love the random number. I love the fact that he swapped out the dice and matched the madness with a deck of cards, mm-hmm. similar to how you play it with. He almost looked at Gloomhaven and said, "How can we incorporate Gloomhaven's mechanic?" into our game they replace the dice with a deck of cards so the cards become actions and they become the random number generator and the random number generator in those cards is more favorable to successes than the dice were Hmm. they've done a very very good job making that system work i love the story i just wish they lowered the difficulty and guess what they have um and i am opinionated because i learned how to play the game at at, in hobbiton so that's my number five pick lord of the rings journey to middle earth at that point uh, everything else is brand spanking new games I've not mentioned before. So, uh, it's weird. It's on five. I think there's three. Th- oh, two, my two of mine are ones we've mentioned before. Three are not. So, top for number, number five, one is just the most obvious one. We know what your one is, but go on. Uh, so, my number five of games played in 2019 uh, is a game that again was recommended and played it and it was amazing i went out and bought all the expansions for it and that is western legends, western legends. so and there's not much else to say about it if you haven't played the game try it it is basically open world sandbox style in the wild west yeah i think the reason why i haven't jumped on it is what's the other one the other western themed game that's pretty uh cool. western trail western trail great western trail because we have western trail we played it twice Middling and reviews on that. It's not a bad game. It's just, it's 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 a not a bad. It's a really actually an enjoyable game for what it is. It is really complex, mm-hmm. but it's an enjoyable game. It's one of those things where I'm not a huge fan of the genre, so to have two of them be like, like can we get some play out of this one first? So that's your number five. Mm-hmm. My number four is a game I just got three weeks ago. It's called Dreamscape by Silex. So often do I get that email dreamscape by silex that i just call it dreamscape by silex probably because the name silex is just really cool so it's not just it's just called dreamscape but i keep on calling it dreamscape by silex and dreamscape by silex is a beautiful game it's the reason why i back kickstarter more so than the big miniature based games Mm -hmm. i love these really nice feel good games no miniatures this game could have easily have been miniatures there is such a place for miniatures but nope just wooden beautiful wooden miniatures but it's definitely got that classic beauty look it's a way that you know those games that are just made of wood maybe eight seven or eight years ago no miniatures no plastic just wood and cardboard and they're really beautiful mm-hmm. that's what this is it's mm-hmm. just it has a bag this big of just wooden tokens mm-hmm. 
and everyone gets a color and you're basically trying to assemble dreams and you have a little a little um cartoon a little a little grid on your own dream mm -hmm. and you're trying to collect dream tokens from these areas and you're moving between these dream areas and you're collecting and you're trying to create patterns and then moving your dreamer through those patterns and if you complete a pattern on a card you have you get those points you move on to the next one you're trying to assemble and you're moving the dreamscape and yeah in another game you would have had like miniatures and terrain and you'd be moving around this surreal landscape but in this you have to use your imagination you have to say like yeah mountains are gray discs and waters are blue discs and, and earth is green discs you're moving them around placing them on top of each other but in reality, or at least in the meta of the game, you are creating this dreamscape and it's moving up and down, in and out. Hmm. And then you're just trying to gain points. And then there are two difficult, two additional expansions with ravens and one's uh, got uh, snow with snowmen. And then there's an expansion version which has uh, a nightmare, which we're probably going to play with just because there isn't a lot of interaction. But the fact that you actually gain these nightmare, these red discs, but there's a way of trying to get rid of the red discs and it adds a more complex. Um, I would say it was one of the more enjoyable games. Once again, you may not like it because there's not a lot of interaction. Mm -hmm. You are moving some, um, on a board together and you're claiming tokens the other person might claim, but there's nothing you can do that'll damage another person's dreamscape. You only, you only interact on that main board. Uh, it was not an expensive game. It is a beautiful game. And uh, I would absolutely say it's one of the best games of 2019. That is Dreamscape by Silex. Cool. So my number four for top five games of 2019 is a game that, uh, again, as I've said before, I had passed on this franchise for so long. And then I finally got this uh, entry into the franchise. And I was just like, what? Oh, this is actually a decent game. And that is Zombicide Invader. Mm, of course, yeah, now the book come. Yeah, and that one uh, just <laughs> except for when I have just small games, you're gonna have these big bombastic. Oh yes, yeah. they're always big and bombastic. Yes, actually, no, no, actually, pretty much most of them are. Um, but yeah, for me, that one just uh, it was amazing. It was a game where I could like then say, "Oh my gosh, we should get this," and I could tell the wife, "I'm like, yes, yeah, it's gonna cost like three hundred bucks to get all the stuff for," it. and she's like, oh, "Okay, yeah, it was a pretty good game. Let's do that." So to get buy-in from the wife makes it on the list because a lot of times there's no buy-in. It's just like, <sighs> yeah, getting, getting a wife to get behind a game, you're like, oh, I have carte blanche. I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> it, it means a lot. Yeah. So that's my number four, Zombicide and Vader. When Nicole smacked me in the back of my head for about to cancel a board game, I'm, I'm trying to be fiscally responsible. She's like, I don't care. I'm like, I love you. Um, my number three is a game called Pandorum. Uh, I did a review for this quite a few months ago. Um, it is very unusual because it is a colonization game where people are competing. They have these big floating aircraft carriers, basically flying aircraft carriers that are going about depositing colonies. And the fact that you're, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just an area control game. That's mm -hmm. all it is. Area control, gain points. But the fact that they built it out of a space horror setting was almost unnecessary because the game is almost terrifying and it shouldn't be it's just an area control game yeah. but there's volcanoes and there's alien civilizations and weird monoliths and and it's such it, the setting is dark the artwork is dark and foreboding even the mm -hmm. space landscape is just like this is like if someone grabbed the alien setting and said, hey, let's play Catan on LV-426. <laughs> That's basically what this is. So it's, it's basically it's Catan on LV-426. Because it's just that crazy, it's just a crazy setting. And of course, it's named after, it's called Pandorum. And Pandorum is only referenced in the movie. The movie Pandorum invented the term Pandorum. So there's no reason to name this game Pandorum. Unless it's the sequel to the movie. And it's totally not. But it, the game is... Other than the fact that the manual is written by somebody who doesn't speak English, it is, it is an incredibly fun game. Mm. And that is my number three pick, Pandorum. So my number three pick for a top games, top five games of 2019 is a game that has a couple issues, but while we were able to actually homebrew them without even going to the internet, which is kind of like, I looked at them and was like, yeah, no, we're going to do this. We're going to fix that. And we're just going to do that. And instantly the game is amazing. And it incorporates the old uh, cop action dramas of oh, the 80s and the really? 90s. Vice, what are they? Brook, Brook, Brook City. City. 
and that's my number three of, for game of 2019. You must have had a good experience because when we first played that the first time, I thought it was just okay. Yeah, no, I, I, I think had you, an amazing you, experience. You had a better experience we, with when it. We, when, we, when, we, when I went back and I changed a few things and giving people extra actions, it changed the game phenomenally. All of a sudden, it was it felt like you were playing the movie. Everybody was just like, action Jackson, you know. Yeah, you know, I think it was because we also, when we were playing the game, we I don't think we fully understood what was going on. No, we didn't. Yeah. And as soon as we, I made those few little tweaks, it felt like you were literally playing a movie, one of the movies of like Lethal Weapon. It was just like, yeah, it was good. So that's my number three, Brook City. Uh, my number two pick. Uh, I don't understand why they made this. I, why well, it's it's one of those. I don't back the big miniature games mm-hmm. where it's like eighty percent box, twenty percent, eighty percent miniature, twenty percent box. Uh, I back this one because I liked the franchise, and I am a and I wished, and I wish the game designers would take this concept, and build cheaper games from them so I can buy them. Mm-hmm. And that's the Hellboy board game. Mm-hmm. Hellboy the board game, is fun, it's empowering, and it is the opposite. Of the Reckoners in every respect. It is the opposite. You haven't really played the game fully, but no, but it is I, the yeah. opposite of Reckoners in every respect. It's still random. You're still rolling dice, but in Reckoners, you are not powerful. Nope. You are insufficient. Everybody else is more powerful than you, and all you can do is battle against a coming tide in hopes that you will gain the resources and you will likely lose. But on the slim chance you'll win, it's by defeating these guys that are more powerful than you, so you can take on. Say it's like the boys, where you are incredibly weak and you can only survive by being quiet and stealthy and being lucky. Well, and, and also the, the mechanic that seems, or the trope that I'm seeing and thinks, or seeing that maybe it's envisioning with some of these games is just like, yeah, you're going to win, but uh, you may be the only one out of your entire party that survives. You may be the one left with PTSD. Yeah. Or, or, or else in the case dead. of that game, it's just like, you win, it'll be the skin of your teeth, and you will have just won. And in the Hellboy game... And we have checked multiple times to make sure we're playing it right. We're like, I, I still remember this. We played the game. We finished it. We won. And one of my friends looked at me and said, I'm getting a feeling that I've never experienced in a game before. Like, what is it? I felt that I was good at what I did. I, my character was fun. I did things. I felt powerful. I felt emboldened. Because you're playing characters. You're playing the main characters from the Hellboy comic. And so, rightfully so, you should be able to kick ass. And you do. And you roll dice and you go, wow, I punched that guy into the in, in, into the next well, into the next sewer. And you go another one and go, wow, there's a big monster there. Wow, we killed him in three turns. Did we die? No, no, we, we won. Is the game too easy? It's like, no, it's still difficult, but we are powerful enough, mm-hmm. right? Because if you do certain things in a certain time period, you make the end boss easier. And we were able to do that on now three occasions, and the end boss was easier, so we defeated him. And it's like, oh. Is that it? Like, yeah, we won. Like, well, that was fun. It's just too bad that, that the core game is $100 mm-hmm. for what amounts to six missions. And the expansions are all expensive because they're always, I mean, like there's four trays of, of miniatures that are just replications. Like there's six miniatures. Like there's six opponents and there's six copies of each. So it's just like a lot of replication. Mm-hmm. And it's like you have a miniature of Hellboy and there's an alternate Hellboy. And then there's the bust of Hellboy you put on the on the initiative tracker. Like, there's a lot of excess miniatures in that game. Mm-hmm. But it is so much darn fun. And that is Hellboy the board game. All right. My number two game carries the trend. Uh, I've started to really enjoy narrative games or, or thinky games. Um, ones that make you, th- that come with packages in the sense of it's you've got a, a scenario and it's all packaged up and you unpackage that thing and you play it out. Um, so I guess it's more of a sort of a legacy style type in a game, but this one is definitely set in a time frame I really like, which is um, in the 1920s type kind of stuff. Uh, when you're talking like the back when the mob was, you know, the decent mob. Um, I guess the 1890s, maybe 1920s. The honor bound mob. <laughs> the honor bound mob type kind of thing. Honor among thieves. You know, private dicks and all that kind of stuff. You know. And that is Detective City of Angels. Um, it's a really good game. Uh, I've had someone who, when we played it, they said, well, there's a couple things that need to be tweaked. Yes, but still, having played that game, 
love it. I backed it instantly when I went back to Kickstarter for an expansion. It's not expensive. It is a fairly cheap board game. Um, I think it was like 90 bucks. And then uh, the expansion when it came back to Kickstarter was like 30 bucks or something. It, it, it's not an expensive game. But it still has minis. Hmm. And everything so. Uh, including little detective hats. Little fedoras. I was joking about the because you gave me the box top for my video, so. Yeah. No one's called me out on it, but yeah. Yeah. No, I heard it's a good game. It's just it's interesting that it's it's it looks so much like the, all the other detective games, but it's so totally not. It's oh, totally yeah. different than those. Yeah, for sure. All right, going for number one. <laughs> all right, my number one game of 2019 was a game that we I finally got to the table. Heavy at, on the app integration. Um, I thought it was kind of going kind to of be a, a very hard game to get back to the table, but we have played it six times in the past month and a half. Wow. Um, and it's to the point where it's more of a... And we played the same mission sometimes. Like, we played the one mission three times and had three different outcomes. The first time we played it, we were like cock of the walk. We were amazing. We were like playing and we were doing amazing second two times we uh we sucked and we thought it was because we rotated who was in charge each time no it's just dirt sit certain things happen we chose to do different things in the mission and it just changed the outcome and that is u-boot madara is not on your top five no it is not how was madara it literally topped every single list that you've had how yep. did madara not gotten you not get in your top five because these games are more fun for me right now wow yeah so that is u-boot no uh, no no you get off of that but really i mean because yeah. i because i was very envious you got into u-boot and it's interesting now because now i'm in a circle that would play u-boot and nicole is now kind of getting on my case because she's the she's kind of annoyed that i kind of threw under the bus because it's like she's the reason why i didn't back it yeah. She wasn't going to play it. It was real time. And I wasn't going to play the game without her. And yeah. now I have like three or four friends who are like, oh, yeah, we would totally love this game. And Nicole's oh, yeah. like, well, no, I would have played the game. I'm like, oh, now she says it. Because <laughs> I totally would have backed this game because I have four or five friends I would play this game yeah. with. And I don't think they're going to retail. I think it was a, a no, that, that is, Kickstarter That sale. is a Kickstarter thing. Just looking at the miniature and, and it all. Yeah. yeah but go on, go on, yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's amazing. And it, it even... The only thing I've, we've run into this game that we've had some problems with is that it has a very high difficulty, even on the lowest setting. Ah, and you don't get frustrated by that? No. But part of that, we think, also is that there's certain things that there there's a, uh, a button for launching the torpedoes that is the salvo button, and then there's launch, you can launch the torpedoes one by one by one. Now, if they designed it, which I think they possibly did, but there's no mention of it, which is unfortunate. Or maybe there is because there's a lot of technical documentation in this game. Because when you actually have the person doing the navigation, they're literally doing navigation the way you would actually have navigated the sub back in the like the 40s. The guy has uh, takes out an actual protractor, 360 protractor, plots your course, plots your bearings, and then relays that back. Then when you encounter the enemy, he has to take the bearing on a dial set the bearing of your sub set the bearing of them set the course set the where the their heading is and everything to pr figure out what your torpedo optimal alignment would be and stuff so oh yeah it's it's complex but a lot of fun but the problem with the the torpedo button i was talking about is if they did it well, the way i think they did but it may i may have missed in the documentation when you launch torpedoes in that age in from a salvo there was actually they were spread hmm. so it wasn't all just shot from the same on the same bearing right. they actually spread the torpedoes so you yeah. had a better chance of hitting it now if you're firing a single torpedo and you salvoed it it would knock its bearing off technically right which is i think is what was happening to us as opposed to if you fire and we haven't had a chance to test it out in theory um because it was just something i read the other day and we're going to go back and check it and so if you fire the torpedo tube a sole torpedo tube then it should be on the bearing you set it for and you probably have a greater chance of hitting him. Um, the reason this is important is because we were firing single torpedoes using the salvo button, which was seems to be a throwing off because we had perfect lineup, but the torpedo still missed. 
And the problem with that is that you only have a certain amount of orders and flooding the tube, locking onto the ship and firing the torpedo is three orders out of your eight in the order track. Right. So you run out of orders real quick. Right. So if you've run out of orders and you've now pissed off the court, the, the escort, which you didn't sink because your torpedoes missed, now you got to dive the sub and hope to God nothing happens. And you get below those depth charges, or else it's game over. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. It's it's an amazing game. Like we, if we, there's another opportunity, I think I may try to pick it up. Yeah, it's it's uh, but it is a game where we've played it with less than four people, and oh my god, you really need four people. There is so much shit going on that you need four people, and especially one time we played where we had a guy, new guy, and we set, made him the captain, and. We're lined up for the torpedo. We fire the torpedo. It missed. Not really that surprised because the crew, the destroyer was coming straight at us. Right. And so I'm like, what do you want to do? And he's thinking, I'm just like, um, just so you know, it's 1,000 meters away. And he's still thinking, I'm like, it's 900 meters away. He's still thinking 800 meters away. I'm like, Captain, you need to make a decision. Like, all of a sudden, you can hear the shots shooting at our periscope now. I'm like... Make a freaking decision. And he's like, oh, uh, and he's, he starts picking up the, the technical mis- documentation and looking stuff. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm like, we're, st- we're sitting with our periscope up above the water at flank speed, heading right towards this other ship going to flank speed. They're going to totally collide with the sub. And, and so I'm like, they're at 300 meters from us. And he, he and I look at the first officer. I'm like, yeah, I'm diving the sub. <laughs> So I mutiny dived the dive the sub, but I couldn't get below the depth charges in time because we didn't have a captain who made a decision fast enough. Yeah, this is a situation where Nicole would not play that game. Yeah, she would freeze. She would lock up. Yeah, well, that's where you just don't make them the captain. Yeah, and that's not a problem. But even now, you put, put a time crunch on her, she'll get she'll get annoyed. My uh, my number one pick um, is not that, but it's still a very fun game. It's called Morn Quest. Ah, uh, I know Sam Healy really loves this game. And it is a really fun game. It's based on a series of books. The art style is very interesting, so it's very inconsistent. Some of the art is really good. Mm -hmm. Some of it, not so much. The miniatures are very imaginative, and there's a lot of them, which is really nice. And you're basically a bunch of fantasy creatures that are moving around this very, um, almost a fraud-like landscape, trying to lock these keys. To lock these keys, you have to get certain supplies, and then get these monster plus, certain these certain symbols. You get these symbols to a location, get them all. You've locked that location before the beast in that location pops out. If it pops out, it's going to start making a mess and making it really hard to, to deal with the end boss. It is almost like a fantasy version of Reckoners, mm. except there's no random number generator. Mm. You know on the board what's going to happen and where. You know where you need to be to do what. The random number generator, you're pulling things out of the bag and new enemies are popping up from, from the corners. And sometimes you can deal with them, sometimes you have to walk away. But that's the only thing. Everything else you're like, oh, that's where this guy is. This is how this this guy is far from escaping. And this guy is far from escaping. And you can play those all, get, and you can look at the map and go, this is what we need to do. And if you get at least the majority of the keys locked, the end boss pops up, mm-hmm. and the end boss is really hard, but if you have closed up those other four keys, he becomes a heck of a lot easier. And then you got to close his seal down. He is, I think, a bit too difficult. Mm-hmm. That being said, we won. But we won because, unfortunately, the game is not 100% balanced for two people. Because he hits, there's four keys, mm-hmm. and if you're standing at that key when he hits it, you take a hit and you get pushed back. Fine. If there's no if there's nobody there, he hits that key. And if that key gets damaged twice, he breaks out and you all lose. Which means what happens and you have, and you can go up to four characters mm-hmm. and there are four keys. What if you play with two people? You can't cover all four keys. Nope. So you gotta play with four people. So despite the fact that the game goes from one to four players, you basically have to play with four characters no matter what you do. But yeah. So the worst difficulty is three because that means you won't be able to cover one field. We played the game twice. We've won both times, though, but that is an intrinsic flaw with the game. But it looks really good. I love its uniqueness. Mm-hmm. It's not terribly difficult. That is Mourn Quest. 
All right. Number five. Number five was... These are best games. was Western Legend. Number four was Zombicide Invader. Number three was Brick City. Number two was Detective City of Angels. And number one was U-Boot. Someone's going to tell you that Western Legend didn't come out in 2019. Probably. I'm but, almost going to guarantee it didn't. But there's expansions that are still coming out that haven't... That were from the original that. Kickstarter. My five is Lord of the Rings, Journey of Middle Earth. Number four is Dreamscape by Silence. Number three is Pandora. Number two is Hellboy, the board game. And number one is Morn Quest. And I've been Dave. And I have been Chris. And remember, remember, the rules, the rules are, are just, just a suggestion. suggestion. Play, play the, the game, game how you want to play it. it. I always stumble that one little line. I know, right? Pow. <laughs> 